everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar today. Today I'm going to show you some great research that was done to better understand eye disease using ICT's products to quantify and visualize caspase activity, apoptosis, pyroptosis, and cell death. I hope this data will give you some inspiration when setting up your next experiments. My name is Sally Head Dahlquist, and I'm president of Immunochemistry Technologies. I have a BS in genetics and cell biology and an MBA. I've been with ICT for over 20 years. I was one of the first employees, so I started by working in the lab, developing a lot of new products, and now I'm the president. Um, assisting me today are Allison Westcott, our customer service manager, and Nick Weninger, our scientific associate, who put together much of this data. So thanks to Allison and Nick for helping. And for those of you out there watching, we greatly appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Your phone has been muted, however, we encourage your questions, so just type them into the chat box on your screen and select Send to Host. Or you can email them to help at immunochemistry.com, and we will respond directly to you right after the webinar is over. And also, we will post the recording on our website and send you a link so you will be able to watch it again at any time and pause it on the slides that you'd like to look at more and share it with your colleagues. At ICT, we're on a mission to help cure disease, and we do that by providing better assays to study cell death. And they have been used extensively in ocular research. Our products have been used by researchers all over the world and are highly cited in over 2,000 publications. I mean, I'm humbled by all the work that all the researchers have been done. It's amazing. Today I'm going to review some of the papers on diabetic retinopathy, retinitis pigmentosa, macular degeneration, glaucoma, and cornea disorders. I'll go over the data and show you the different eye tissues that have been studied and types of cells, including retinal cells, glios, parasites, corneal cells, and some of the animal models, like even human cells, live uh, rats, mice, and even zebrafish. We hope this will, and we hope this will help you when designing your next experiment. Um, with this review of eye disease, I'm going to focus on two of our fluorescent probes, Flicka, that's typically used in culture cells, and Flevo for use in live animals. Um, so I want to tell you quickly how they work. These are labeled caspase inhibitors that measure apoptosis via caspase activity or pyroptosis if you're looking for caspase 1. Uh, they're really easy test kits. You just add the reagent directly to the cell culture or direct it directly inject it directly into the animal, either intravenously or even intravitreally, and they will bind to active caspases and form a strong covalent bond. So we see here at the bottom. Um, they won't react with procaspases nor inactive enzymes, and the reaction is fast. It starts happening within 15 minutes of adding to the plate or injecting into the animal. These are non-cytotoxic with minimal background staining and will remain inside the cell for detection as long as the cell membrane is intact. So they can be detected at many wavelengths like red, green, near infrared, and at 660. So you can detect them with a microscope, plate reader, flow cytometer, an animal imager, scanning laser ophthalmoscope, and other imagers. And they're compatible with other stains like GFP, DAPI, and hooks. We'll start by looking at some of the retinal diseases. Um, diabetic retinopathy is a leading cause of blindness, and it is a progressive condition. It gets worse over time. High blood sugar damages the small blood vessels all over the body, including in the eye. These teeny tiny vessels in the retina weaken and bulge, causing microaneurysms. This leads to cell swelling of the macula, which is a little spot in the middle of the retina, and you can see it here in the image at left, macula. And that's responsible for clear central vision, fine details, and color. So you get spots and blurry vision. And over time, new blood vessels grow and leak into the vitreous. That's the fluid in the back of the eye. Let's see down here, they're growing. Uh, the retina may detach, the scar tissue will form, and pressure in the eye increases, damaging the optic nerve, leading to glaucoma and blindness. But there is a lot of research going on right now in this area, so let's take a look. For diabetic retinopathy, 
diabetic retinopathy, I'd like to highlight the work of researchers at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. They published many papers exploring the role of TXNIP, which is thioredoxin, or thioredoxin interacting protein. And this is a critical this plays a critical role in inflammation and retinal injury, especially in the early stages of diabetic retinopathy, including apoptosis, cellular oxidative stress, and DNA damage. Um, this is a really exciting experiment that was done in 2010 because this is the first time an in vivo assay, our green flavo kit, was used to detect active caspase 3 in the retina of intact animals. That is shown in the picture on right, and this is from figure 1E which is a retinal flat mount um, with the ganglion cell layer showing apoptotic cells, which are yellow-green. These retinas are from adult male Sprague Dolly rats injected with STZ to induce diabetes and sacrificed on day 30. The green carboxyfluorescein fan flevo reagent was injected in the tail vein that's intravenously and circulated for 30 minutes prior to sacrifice. The retina was fixed in 4% paraformaldehyde for 20 minutes and processed to create the retinal flat mount. The red stain nissel was used to label all the neurons red. Fan flevo is seen as the bright yellow-green spot in the right at D here. This data supports that TXNIP is pro-inflammatory and pro-apoptotic. It mediates neuronal apoptosis by activating caspase 3 and gliosis by upregulating GFAP, that's gliofibrillary acid protein, which is increased in the diabetic rat retina and is considered to be an early sign of retinal injury and the start of, of disease. Here is a cross-section of the retina. In the previous slide, we looked at a retinal flat mount with the ganglion cell layer on top which is shown here on the top layer of this cross-section. And over here, we see the ganglion cell layer in their images. Um, here we're looking at a cross-section of the retina and as stained with flevo. In this experiment, they wanted to inhibit TXNIP, so stop it from working, to reduce inflammation and apoptosis. And yes, this experiment shows that inhibiting TXNIP inhibits caspase 3 in the GCL, which we see that in the picture at the middle right. This little arrow points to a yellowish-green apoptotic cell that's been stained with FAM flevo. Let's see this little right here is that apoptotic cell. Um, this paper showed that diabetes induces glial activity and ganglion injury early in diabetic retinopathy. In their next papers, paper, the researchers from Wayne State looked at parasites. Parasite cells are found all around the blood vessels in the normal retina, and they help maintain the vasculature and regulate nutrient transport across the blood-brain bar barrier. You can see them here in a healthy eye and here in a diseased eye. Uh, parasite loss is one of the early features of diabetic retinopathy. Since TXNIP is upregulated and it mediates inflammation and apoptosis, does it lead to parasite apoptosis and death? Yes, it does. So let's take a look at their data. This is from figure 2D. These are cultured parasite cells from rats. The cell line is TR-RPCT1. And they maintained these cells for five days and then treated them with high glucose or low glucose for five days. Then they added ICT's red SR flevo for 30 minutes. Remember, flevo is cell permeant and it binds to active caspase 3. Then they washed the cells and fixed in 4% per month paraformaldehyde. DAPI was also used to stain the nuclei blue. On the right, with the high glucose condition, you can see apoptotic retinal parasites because they're stained red using SR flebo. That is these arrows here.
This paper shows that TXNIP upregulation during chronic hyperglycemia leads to retinal parasite apoptosis and death. Next, the team at Wayne State looked at molar glia cells using rat RMC1 cells. In the retina, the molar glia, here they're green, um, they span the entire thickness of the retina and contact all retinal neurons. They, helped pro they help protect nerve cells. Virtually every retinal disease is associated with reactive molar cell gliosis, which may either support survival or accelerate neurodegeneration. Molar glia are the resident innate immune cells that normally produce pro-inflammatory cytokines and growth factors to restore tissue homeostasis. But in chronic conditions such as diabetic retinopathy, um, the retinal gliosis is prolonged, causing sustained inflammation, cell injury, death, and the disease gets worse. Um, in this little sch schematic, it's showing that chronic hyperglycemia increases TXNIP in the molar glia. It triggers the innate immune response, unfolded protein response, oxidative stress, inflammation, autophagy, and apoptosis. So let's review their experiment with the molar cells. These are rat RMC1 molar glia cells. Uh, from figure 2D, they did a time course study of high glucose treatment at 25 millimolar from 0 to 24 hours and tested for caspase 1 activity with ICT's FAMYVAD probe, which is green. These cells are also stained with DAPI, so the nuclei are blue. In these pictures, you can see more green apoptotic cells at 24 hours. Those are the green cells here at the right. There are a few here at four hours, but not very many at zero and two hours. Uh, high glucose induces TXNIP expression, and caspase-1 activity increases over time, which we see here from zero to 24 hours. Another group of eye diseases is called retinitis pigmentosis, which is a collection of about 50 rare genetic disorders that destroy the retina, so you lose your peripheral vision and have trouble seeing at night. These gene mutations prevent the photoreceptor cells from working properly, and the photoreceptors absorb the light and convert it to electrical systems through the opti op optic nerve. And there are two kinds. Those are the rods and the cones, which you can see in this cross-section here, the rods and the cones. Uh, the rods enable us to see in dim and dark light and are in the outer regions of the retina. The cones are mostly in the central retina and help us see fine detail and color. They are in the outer nuclear layer next to the retinal pigment epithelial cells. And we see that the RPE are studied a lot. You have more examples of them. Um, the RPE are next to the choroid, next to the retina, that nourishes the nerves. It helps transport molecules in and out of the retina and modulates immune factors. Um, the retinitis pigmentosis affects about 1 in 4,000 people who will slowly lose their vision over time as the rods and cones die. So let's take a look at an experiment here that's trying to keep those RPEs alive. Um, in this paper, researchers from the Stem Cell Research Laboratory in Bangalore, India, were studying primary retinal pigment cells from human cadaver eyes. They were investigating anti-VEGF, that's VEGF agents, like bevacinzumab, that's BEV. VEGF is a major angiogenic factor, so it helps grow blood vessels, that regulates vasculature in the retina and choroid and is secreted by RPE cells. High levels of VEGF are seen in most phasal proliferative eye diseases. Therefore, we thought anti-VEGF agents may be a possible treatment. BEV is a widely used VEGF binding protein in clinical practice um, that is actually injected intervitreally into the eye. But many patients don't respond and it has some major adverse side effects when used long term. Long -term. So what is the immediate effect of BEV in cultured primary retinal pigment epithelial cells from human cadavers that could lead to complications? 
In this study, they established primary RPE cultures from human cadaver eyes. They, the cells were isolated within 24 hours of enucleation, that's removal from 10 do, donor eyes, and then cultured. The cells were treated with control or BEV at two, four, or six hours. Then they added the green FLICA9 caspase 9 inhibitor reagent for two hours and co-labeled with blue DAPI. Um, these images are from figure four. And we see in the middle images C and F, after treatment, there is not much apoptosis going on here. There are really no green cells. There's kind of one background cell here in F. But overall, apoptosis is not happening. Um, normally, apoptotic cells would be green, and the non-apoptotic cells are dark in the background. And there aren't very many of them. And in this experiment, we see that short exposures to BEV do not change the level of apoptosis. Oops, sorry, went backwards. In our next experiment, this is an in vivo study that our partners at OPTHDS in Kalamazoo, Michigan did to evaluate our 780 polycaspase inhibitor probe, 70 YVAD, 780YVAD FMK, in whole retina. Um, they used pigmented Lewis rats and exposed them to intense blue light uh, on day zero. Blue light damage causes the photoreceptors and the RPE to undergo apoptosis, inflammation, and phagocytosis for three to five days, which results in a significant thinning of the retina. On day two, they injected 780 flevo intravenously and then imaged the retinas using a Heidelberg spectralis confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscope. Flevo was visualized using angiography mode. And here we see that A and B, the top two control animals, that 780 flevo is not really accumulating compared to the experimental rats in C and D. We see that flevo is accumulating, indicating that apoptosis is occurring in those areas. In this study, the researchers at Skeppens Eye Research Institute in Massachusetts were creating an in vitro model for proliferative vitreal retinopathy, which is a common compl complication of retinal detachment. Um, they got PVR membranes from six human patients and successfully created the cultures and tested them with me methotrexane, MTX. Methotrexane is an antifolate drug that's been used to treat cancer for a long time and may be helpful to prevent PVR. Uh, this is from figure six, and cells were cultured for six weeks, exposed to a control or methotrexane. That's the top row, um, is the control, A, B, and C. Exposed to methotrexane is the bottom row, J, K, L. Um, so they were exposed to that. Um, and then the researchers added uh, FLICA, our green stain, for one hour, and then added hooks for 10 minutes to label all cells blue. The cultures were washed with EBM2 media and fixed with 4% paramaldehyde for 10 minutes. They used ICT's green flicka caspase 37 inhibitor reagent to show that MTX induced regulated cell death, it's apoptosis, which are the green cells in the bottom row, you can tell, K and L. Um, the harvested cells grow, grew robustly, and they produced key features of human PVR, including responding to methotrexane. This model will work well to study PVR. Next, let's look at macular degeneration. Macular degeneration causes the loss of central vision, and age-related macular degeneration is the leading cause of irreversible blindness in the elderly of industrialized nations. The macula is a small spot in the back of the retina, which we also looked at in another um, diagram, um, and that macula is responsible for central vision, color vision, and fine detail. It detects light and sends signal to the brain, while the rest of the retina processes peripheral vision. Age-related macular degeneration comes in two forms, the dry 
atrophic form, which is what most people have, and the wet exudative form, which is less common. In the dry AMD, the macula thins and stops working, while in the wet AMD, the fluids start leaking from new blood vessels from under the macula. In this lab, they were studying chronic inflammation and macular degeneration caused by released mitochondrial DNA. Uncon uncontained mitochondrial DNA is thought to be uh, pro-inflammatory in other diseases such as Alzheimer's, rheumatoid arthritis, heart failure, and neurodegeneration. And retinas from uh, patients with macular degeneration have consistently revealed mitochondrial DNA damage. So will mitochondrial DNA activate caspase-1 in RPE cells? And in this experiment, they found that it will. So these are human ARPE19 cells that were transfected with a control or mitochondrial DNA. 24 hours later, they were labeled with ICT's green caspase-1 probe, FAM, YVAT, FMK for two hours, and washed. And 10 minutes after that, HOOKS was added to label the nuclei blue. In, this, in these pictures, apoptotic cells are green, which is seen in the picture on the right and not really on the left control cell. In this experiment, they found that intracellular mitochondrial DNA induces ARP19 cells to eventually become apoptotic. Now I'll show some examples of experiments looking at glaucoma. Glaucoma is typically caused by high pressure in the eye that damages the optic nerve. It is a neurodegenerative disease that damages and kills the retinal ganglion cells leading to vision loss and blindness. I'm gonna show you a few papers that studied this by imaging apoptosis in vivo. In this study, uh, researchers at the University of Utah wanted to know if radiation would help glaucoma by reducing neurodegeneration, and yes, it does. Here they used a mouse model that expresses GFP, that's green fluorescent protein, in the microglia. This is the D2.CX3CR1-GFP positive line. So to stain for apoptosis, they needed a red probe because they didn't want any artifacts from euthanasia and histology processing. They used our in vivo kit, Flevo, in red sulforotamine. So they irradiated the mice. Then eight hours later, they injected Flevo IV, that's intravenously in the tail vein. And another eight hours later, they sacrificed the mice. They made retinal flat mounds, fixed for 30 minutes, and then counterstained with hooks 33258. With these images, the control mice are on the left and the irradiated mice are on the right. The top two, A and B, are the entire retinal whole mount and the little squares here that you see are the optic disc, which is enlarged below in C and D. The irradiated retina in B on the top right up here shows numerous and conspicuous apoptotic microglia, mostly localized to the optic disc and central retina. The arrowheads are the mid-peripheral area in which some microglial cells are detected. This experiment showed that irradiation reduced microglial activation, and that is associated with reduced optic nerve and retinal neurodegeneration in the D2 mouse model of glaucoma. In this study, researchers from Brown University in Rhode Island were investigating the role of N-methyl D aspartate receptors. That's NMDA receptors. Overactivation of NMDA receptors uh, causes mitochondrial dysfunction in retinal ganglion neurons. In this paper, they showed that short polyarginine peptides like CR7 target mitochondria to promote neuronal survival. In this experiment, they injected rats intravitrally, that's right in the eye, with a control or with NMDA, which induces apoptosis with a peak at two hours, or with uh, several different peptides to block NMDA-induced activation of caspases. Here's some data from figure six. Uh, 
one hour after they were injected, uh, each rat was injected intravenously, that's IV, with green flevo in the tail vein. And then and one hour after that, the eyes were quickly dissected, fixed, and retinal flat mounts were prepared with the ganglion cell side up. These images incorporated a one millimeter thick band that passed through the optic nerve head and was imaged using a FITSI filter pack. So in the, the top picture, which is the NMDA-treated retina, many cells in the ganglion cell layer were caspase positive. So you can see these bright spots even in the black and white. The staining is absent in the bottom picture, which is the retina treated with uh, the small molecule, the CR7 slash NMDA. These researchers also counted the caspase positive cells and created a bar graph here. Three of the six treatments had a significant difference from NMDA-treated retina. Those are the three in the middle with the asterisks. And this shows that treatment with compounds like CR7 that stabilize the mitochondria may protect retinal ganglion cells function from damage by glaucoma. Researchers at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine in Florida were looking at ocular hi hypertension, that's OHT, in mice eyes. Specifically, they were investigating the role of Panexin-1 channel, that's PANX-1, which activates inflammasomes and eventually induces pyroptosis. So they wanted to map the activity of pyroptosis via caspase-1 interleukin convertase in retinal cells. This is from figure 3A. They used two types of mice here. The wild type control mice are C57BL6, and they are two to four month old males, while the other mice are a knockout of Panax1 double negative. The three mice on the left all have ocular high tension, um, while the last mouse on the right does not. Um, the third column is a wild type mouse that was injected interperitoneally with a Panax1 blocker called probenicet. So they labeled the eyes in vivo. They added it right into the eye. Uh, and 20, 24 hours after injury, they injected our green 660 caspase 1 flicker reagent intravitrally and let that circulate for an hour, then sacrificed the animals. They co-labeled with DAPI to label the nuclei blue, which you see in the top row. The bottom row is just the 660 green flicka. So flicka was imaged by confocal microscopy with excitation at 590 and emission at 660. Most of the caspase one active ones, most of the caspase one active cells, those are the bright green spots, are localized within the internuclear layer, the INL, and the ganglion cell layer, the GCL. As expected, there was a lot of apoptosis in the wild-type mouse with ocular high tension. That's the first column. And caspase activity is suppressed dramatically in the Panax-1 knockout or the treatment with the Panax-1 blocker probenicet. This study supports the feasibility of inflammasome modulation for ocular high tension injuries. In our final section, we have about four slides left, we'll take a look at some cornea studies. In the keratoconus condition, the healthy round cornea becomes thin, up to a quarter of its normal thickness, and bulges into a cone, which distorts vision, which you can see at the right. It will swell, crack, and build up scar tissue slowly over time, leading to blindness. Keratoconus is the leading reason for a corneal transplant. In contrast to the keratoconus condition, where the cornea bulges out, in cornea plana, the cornea is flat. This causes astigmatism, blurred vision, farsightedness, and it appears to be a rare genetic condition. In this study, researchers at the University of California in Irvine were studying keratoconus cornea cells which may be due to increased proteinase activity related to oxidative stress. Hydrogen peroxide may increase in keratoconus eyes, and they wanted to know what is the effect of that. Well, it activates caspase activity and apoptosis, which we see here. This is from figure nine, and these are cultured adherent uh, normal as well as human keratoconus corneal stromal fibroblasts. They were exposed to a control, which is the top two images, 
or hydrogen peroxide as a stressor. That's H2O2 on the bottom two rows. These cells were treated with hydrogen peroxide for one hour, washed, and allowed to recover for one to three hours. The culture media was replaced, and ICT's FAM Flicka caspase 37 inhibitor reagent was added. After another hour, the cell layer was washed three times, and 300 microliters of wash buffer was used to keep the cells from drying. So the keratoconus corneal fibroblast treated with hydrogen peroxide on the right show a significant increase in caspase 37 activity compared to the normal cells on the left. And the non-apoptotic cells are dark in the background. So you can see a lot of apoptosis occurring here. In our last slide of data, we'll look at zebrafish. In contrast to the keratoconus condition where the cornea bulges out, in cornea plana, the cornea is flat. And this is a rare genetic condition with mutations in the human CARA gene, that's K-E-R-A, that codes for keratocan, which is a proteoglycan directly associated with cornea plana. Keratocan can be studied in mice, but researchers would like to look at other models like zebrafish. These two images are live zebrafish embryos that were labeled with ICT's green caspase 8 reagent by adding it to the culture media for 30 minutes. In the embryo on the left, that's the experimental animal, um, that is a morpholino antisense knockout against Z -cara, the zebrafish keratocan gene. And when they knocked it out, that resulted in a lethal phenotype due to massive caspase-dependent apoptosis, which was noted by a significant increase of active caspase 3 and 8. Those are uh, the spots of green cells in the developing forebrain area, including the eyes which is the arrow pointing to the eyes. There are few apoptotic cells in the control embryo on the right. So yes, the z gene can serve as a specific marker for eye tissue and may lead to novel discoveries for the function of z in zebrafish. So that wraps up our data for today. We've covered many topics from age-related macular degeneration to zebrafish. And FLEVO and FLICA are just two methods that can be used to evaluate apoptosis in eye disease in vitro and in vivo. Please try them. If you have any questions about the webinar today or any of the data that you've seen, please feel free to send them to us through the chat box or send an email to help at immunochemistry.com, and we'll respond directly to you. Of course, you can always call us. We love hearing how you're using our products and helping you set up your experiments. And if you'd like to learn more about our other products, please visit our website. We have many resources available online, and you can also find more webinars such as this one uh, on a wide variety of topics from apoptosis to ELISAs. And again, thanks for tuning in today and for all the research you are doing. And thanks again to Allison Westcott, Nick Weniger, and Kristen Pauley, our marketing team, for managing these webinars. We here at ICT are proud to be a part of the medical research community and provide tools like Flicka and Flevo that can help understand and someday cure eye disease and blindness. I'm Sally Head Dahlquist, President of Immunochemistry Technologies, and it's been a pleasure helping you find a cure. <laughs>